sign in. And they didn't That's know why. To sign in. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know everybody's seeing the better signatures. I do know Helen who called. Area Governor, Area 33. Oh. All right. <laughs> she didn't know there would be math in the quiz. Area 33. And he's, he, maybe he's not a dignitary, but he's one of my favorite speakers. And he's actually one of the people that got me involved in Toastmasters way long ago. Connor, why don't you stand up? Connor's got a very good... <laughs> Other than writing books and all these other things, I'll suck up for a while. Uh, other than doing all these other things, what is your special little talent or designation with Postmasters? It's kind of, kind of unique for those of the people that don't know. Uh, I'm an accredited speaker, which I got last year at the International exactly does that entail or what does that mean? Because there's not that many of you characters running around. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds uh, kind of uh, strange the way it's a character. There's, there's only uh, I'm 63 people in the history of Toastmasters who have been given the accredited speaker designation. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be a, a get to ATM bronze at the earliest uh, before you can apply for it. And then you've got to go through an audition process and then uh, you speak at the international convention as well. And the first time you do it, you get turned down. And the second time you do it, you get turned down. And the third time you do it, you get turned down. But actually, when you do it the fifth time, you, you do get accepted. So. <laughs> That's his Irish story, and he's sticking with it. So Connor's an amazing speaker. We had to fill a couple seconds in between there anyway, while Donna was opening up these boxes. So, are you ready to announce some, before we start the second part of the contest this afternoon, we're going to give out some awards for our clubs, so Donna's going to help out with that. Thank you. The of my car keeps getting fuller and fuller with all of this Toastmaster stuff that I have to try to find the clubs to give it to. So anyway, I have four new banners up here. So, it's Oak Brook Speakers here. Yes? Oh, okay. I can do it. So 
a lot of companies got the wrong loans and they're slowly giving them back in because they all are in grave. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I'm using today, I didn't have Gail, but does anybody from, um, let's see, Um, Max Force, Melrose Max Force. No? How about Addison and Elmhurst? I can I can get it to the Addison Elmhurst Club. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, this doesn't take up too much. We'll continue to use it. Okay. One last thing. Some clubs actually got all seven officers trained. And we actually have the ribbons and everything ahead of time. Last time it took a few months, I think. So I know uh, our D131 governor, I'm going to ask uh, Gasco, would like to hand out some. And then if anybody else has any to hand out, so come on up, Linda. <laughs> Chair, is it indeed a pleasure to be able to hand this out? As area governors, we love to see our clubs actually go to the conferences and go to training. And to have seven out of seven officers trained is fantastic. So I would like to recognize those three clubs today. First, we have We Are Republicans who already have their ribbons, so please, those members,
Contestant number five, Hugh Dunbar, D-U-N-B-A-R. <coughs> Contestant number six, Slavik Polinsky. Obviously, it's so easy, I don't have to spell that one. <laughs> but for those of you who might not have heard me, Slavic is spelled S L A W E K Polinsky. P O L I N S K I. And our seventh contestant today, Lynn Pearson. P E A R S O N. Do all the judges have? the names that they need for the ballot. There is no Yes, apparently on the guide today, you have different names, so they might not all match up. That's why I read off the correct list of competitors today. So does everybody have the seven names, especially the judges, you have the seven names of the participants? We will proceed at this time with the international speech contest. As during the first contest, there will be one minute of silence between <coughs> each contestant. Mr. Timekeeper, please advise when we have one minute of silence in between contestants. After all the contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. I'll begin the international speech contest. Mr. Timer, if we could have one minute on the <coughs> Contestant number one, Karen Johnson. What I have learned. What I have learned, Karen Johnson. On August 10, 2010, I spoke at my mother's memorial service. That was a challenging three minutes at a lectern. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and very welcome guests. What I have learned is that we all have a core message that we carry forth into the world. And if we listen to the people who love someone, we can hear it, often through their tears. What I have learned is that we, as experienced Toastmasters, can be a gift to our loved ones and friends when we hear, carry, and deliver those words on a very challenging day for everyone, a memorial service in our loved one's honor. Today, I'd like to tell you the story of how my grieving and speaking preparation was a gift to me to truly hear the core message of my mother's life. The Friday before the Tuesday memorial service, I was at the Catholic Church meeting with the priest <coughs> over the service. When I told him that it was very important to me that I speak for my mother at the Mass, he started telling me stories, trying to convince me that it might not be a good idea. I wasn't flinching. Finally, with a hint of desperation, he said, 
I don't know if I could speak at my mother's funeral. I looked him square in the eyes. I felt something emerging from within. I, sir, am a Toastmaster, and I will speak for my mother. <laughs> These words didn't actually come out of my mouth. Yet, he got the message, because he moved on at that point. On the Tuesday, my mother's service, that morning, I still wasn't quite pleased with what I had prepared. The night before, I thought, I've got to get some sleep. I'll just look at it again in the morning, print it out, and play around with it before the mass starts. I had lots of errands and tasks to do. Great plan, until my printer didn't work. <laughs> I drove to my mother's house. Her very reliable printer wouldn't print. Earlier that day, I had asked Spirit to be with me. I suspected it might be challenging, yet not in that way. My mother's printer was in the room where the paramedics had carried her out 11 days before. Still breathing, but what would be her last day? I sat in her desk chair with a pen and paper in my lap, like the olden days. I felt the tears welling up, looking around the room. And I just let them flow for a long time. I started listening with my heart and mind, and words, phrases, sentences started coming to me, and I was writing them down. Surprisingly, three hours later, when the mass was about to begin, I had made very few changes to the words that came to me in that room. When the priest nodded, my cue to wave him on or step forward, I was ready. Live, love, laugh, family. You'll find those words on the walls and wall decals in the homes of my two oldest nieces. A physical manifestation of the legacy of love left by Lillian Johnson, my mother. As I continued with my reflections, I made eye contact with the family member who inspired or even spoke the words I was delivering. I motioned to the altar boy, her great-grandson, eight years old at the time, who had dubbed her the favorite family nickname, Gigi, for great-grandma as an infant. My family was being a little bit more present. They had kind of calmed down. They were with me now. My mother was also known for her great enthusiasm for adorable or innovative things, both large and small. Her sister had been staying with her for those last two months. We didn't know they were going to be her last two months. She had kidded her a couple of times that her garage might qualify her for that popular television show, Hoarders! <laughs> <coughs> that translated into, Gigi wasn't your typical material girl. <laughs> she had a certain zest for creative expression and often voted for things with her money that she saw that were beautiful in stores or catalogs. I contrasted that with the Catholic Church objectives for the day, a testimony of her faith, her devout Catholic upbringing, and how her faith had shifted yet remained constant throughout her life. I concluded with, with Gigi, if you were a friend of ours, you were family <coughs> to her. Family, live, love, laugh. Seven months and two days after my mother passed away, my boss of 20 years and a great friend passed away. Seven months to the day after that, my father passed away. Three very different people, three very different memorials, three very different core messages. On Monday, it will be seven days since my father passed. It is also the birthday of my new foster child and our three-week anniversary of being together. What I have learned 
is that each of us has that core message, and even while we're still grieving, it can bring us comfort and sometimes even joy to carry that forward for those who have left us. My dad, take care of business, and then relax. My boss, be generous, and treat others how you'd like <coughs> to be treated. My mom, making time to love and laugh with family, that's living. Mr. Toastman. Contestant number two, Ramon Josen. To air is human. To air is human, Ramon Josen. Contest chair, Pedro Toastmaster, honor guest. Thank God it's not Friday. That's what a 10 years old boy wanted was a friend of mine. Because every Friday night, his father comes home, terrorizing his family, and beating his mother. He used his body to protect his mother. He used his body to shield his mother from his father priest. He knew where to hide the kitchen knife. He knew where to hide his baby sister and his brother from the outrage of his fire. An experience that is very hard to forgive. One stormy night, his father came home, drunk, looking for his hunting knife. The boy wouldn't come. The father went to the kitchen. He couldn't find him. <clears throat> the father Got so mad, he shook the boy to the wall. The boy lost consciousness. Upon regaining consciousness, he saw his father holding a shotgun, running through the door outside the house, yelling like a wolf, looking for his wife. The boy ran, searched for his mother. He saw his mother behind the bushes, hiding by the mango tree. The father went to the bushes. But he couldn't find anyone because the mother was lying on the ground, covered by the mango leaves. When the father left, the boy ran to his mother, told his mother, go to the encampment near the river where his small boat was anchored. And then suddenly, a glitter of light he noticed in one of the corners of his eyes. When they turned, he saw one of their neighbors waving at them. So he told his mother, go to the neighbor's husband and hide. Then the boy went back to their house to check his brother and his baby sister. Told them stories, sound songs, like lullabies. It goes, da 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 da, da 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 da. Da 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 And suddenly, after a while, the boy noticed the shouting. 
nothing stuck. So he locked up through the door. He saw his father asleep in one of the couches in the living room. <clears throat> the following day, when his father was sober, his father is a very good father. He helped the people in need. He respected everyone in the community. So for the next seven, six days, the boy will save him the peacefulness of his life by telling jokes to his friends, by telling stories about the angels from the Bible in which he learned from his grandma who is a devoted Catholic. After several months, the father was diagnosed with a life-threatening disease. As a result, he couldn't drink anymore. But the boy developed an emotional problem. He always get in trouble in school. He's so excited. He always wants to pick fight to the other boy in the neighborhood. In a small town, in an island, away from the mainland, there's no doctor who can treat the boy. So for several years, the boy remained untreated until one day, 25 years later, the boy went down to a deep, deep depression. He couldn't sleep. He became hateful. He became paranoid, thinking that he might become like his father. <coughs> he sought medical help and promised his, that he will not hurt his family. So, that's the promise to himself, to control himself. He hid a robe inside the washroom, near the shower pipe protruding from the wall, seven feet above the bathtub, just in case if he could control himself anymore. For the next several years, the boy, was on medication, attended several support groups. In the support groups, they have a prayer for that poor neighbor. And it said, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, the boy is well. He realized life is worth living again. Life is beautiful. Life is wonderful. Life is cool. And he added, you know, I, I have, I'm one of the luckiest person on earth. Having a father and a mother who will work through their lives to give me a good education. I know I have a little problem in my past, but I can see the bright light is waiting for me. And he continued, why did I make this with my father? For giving my father. It's the best gift that I can give myself. I love you now. As Alexander Pope once said, to is human, to forgive is divine. Can I you?
Contestant number three, Nancy Depchik. What's it worth? What's it worth? Nancy Depchik. Has your life ever been turned upside down? Will you find yourself standing there saying, what just happened here? You feel like you're in this bad dream. And if you could just wake up, your life would go back to normal. But when you do wake up, you find out your bad dreams are reality. And your normal has changed forever. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. Just a few years ago, I found myself in a nightmare. My 15-year relationship suddenly ended, and like all unwelcome change, I didn't see it coming. As a result of that, I lost my job. I lost my home. Worst of all, I lost my self-esteem. Have you ever been knocked off your feet so hard you didn't know how you were going to get through the day? Have you ever been so scared you couldn't get out of bed in the morning? Well, that's how I felt. I felt like I'd been crumbled up, thrown to the ground, and dug in the dirt. I felt worthless. My good friend Asha was a little worried about me. She came over one day, gently put a piece of paper in front of me. What's that? An application for volunteer work. Volunteer work? I don't have anything to give to anybody. I've got nothing. I'm worthless. Just think about it. It might make you feel better. That piece of paper lay there for days. I didn't even touch it. But Asha's words kept coming back to me. It might make you feel better. And at that time, I felt so lousy, I would have done anything to feel better. So eventually, I called the number. It was for an organization called HOME, Housing Opportunities and Maintenance for the Elderly. They had a little old lady about 90 years old, and they wanted someone to keep her company. She was depressed, and all I had to do was either read to her, play a game with her, just talk to her, just something to kind of lift her spirits a little. And I thought, well, I can do that. So I decided to say yes. You see, she was 90 years old. I figured, She's probably hard of hearing, <laughs> or incoherent, and chances are even though I couldn't finish a complete thought at that time, she wouldn't understand what I was saying anyway, so what difference did it make? <laughs> so, <coughs> into my life entered Jerry Franklin. I will never forget the first day I met Jerry. <coughs> I went to her apartment building, took the elevator up to the fifth floor, walked down this long, narrow hallway, knocked on her door. She opened the door. <laughs> Jerry was six feet tall. She weighed 82 pounds. She was like this giant string bean <coughs> staring back at me. To top it all off, she wore her hair tied up in this bright turquoise turban. You couldn't see a strand of it. And from head to toe, she was covered in cat hair. <laughs> oh, she was quite a sight. But she had such a wonderful spirit. Every time I went to see Jerry, she got this great big smile on her face. She reached out her arms, and she gave me a great big hug. She called me her angel. She would listen to my stories of how my man had done me wrong, and when I was finished, she'd suddenly yell out, that dirty, 
<laughs> I'll let you fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> when I was going to leave, she told me she was going to miss me. After a little time, I didn't feel so worthless anymore. Jerry passed away last year. But she had a love in her heart I will never forget. And during the time we spent together, she taught me one of the most valuable lessons of my life. It really helped me to turn my life around. And I'm going to share that lesson with you now. I don't know where Jerry learned it. Maybe she read it in a book written by Jack Canfield. Maybe she heard it from a good friend. But this is the lesson I learned from Jerry Franklin. She reached into her purse and she took out a dollar bill. I've adjusted for inflation. Okay. <laughs> Especially those of you way in the back, can you see what this is? It's a hundred dollar bill. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> it is a hundred dollar bill. Brand new, crisp, one hundred dollar bill. How many of you want it? <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> Bear with me. I crumpled it up. How many of you want it now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one more thing. Any of you want it? <laughs> Why? It never lost its worth. So the next time life throws you a curve, you're feeling crumpled up, and some days you may even feel like you've been tossed to the ground and dug in the dirt, no matter what happens, no matter what comes your way, you never, never lose your worth. Mr. Timer, we could have one minute of silence while the judges mark the bell. Contestant number four, Paul Spurgis, the Clay Buddha. The Clay Buddha, Paul Spurgis. Fellow Toastmasters and guests, show of hands, how many of you are going to hear a secret? In 1957, a group of Buddhist monks in Bangkok, Thailand, discovered a secret that had stayed hidden for over 400 years. I'll tell you the story. In the 1500s, the dynasty of Burma, which we now call Myanmar, and the kingdom of Siam, which we now call Thailand, were at war with each other. The Burmese army moved in and attacked a Buddhist monastery in Siam, and at the heart of this Buddhist monastery was a giant clay Buddha. This statue 
was 20 feet tall, and only one of these statues would fit in this, in this room. The army plundered the village, plundered the monastery, but before they left, they killed all of the monks. In 1957, the little village is now Bangkok, Thailand, a city with millions of people. And the monastery is flourishing. There are monks there, they have a residence, they have a temple. The government of Thailand came in and said, you know, we need your campus to build a road to move people around. So we're going to ask you to relocate. So the monks built new housing, different location, built a new temple, and the last thing they had to do was to relocate the clay Buddha to the new location. Well, when the day came, the engineers brought in a crane, they secured all of the rigging, they went to lift it up, and something happened. Something terrible happened. The Buddha tipped, developed several cracks, and so they immediately set it down. But well, what started out as a great day was quickly becoming a terrible day and was about to get worse because now the rain clouds were coming in and it was getting dark. So they built a tent-like structure with bamboo poles over the Buddha and just sat there depressed. During the night, one of the monks got down and took a flashlight and started shining to inspect the damage that had been done to this Buddha, their shrine. And when he shined his light in, a light shined back at him. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> they shined more light at him, and sure enough, the light shined back. So they got some hammers and chisels and carefully started chipping away at the clay. They worked all through the night, and by the time the sun was coming up over the horizon, a solid gold statue of Buddha. Wow. True story. 12,000 pounds of solid gold. What had happened is that the original monks knew that the Burmese army would take anything of value. So they took their Buddha made of gold and they covered it with clay to hide it. So the question is, what's the clay covering the gold inside of you? Is it the clay of a poor self-image? The clay of regret? We've all done things that we're not proud of. The clay of the fear of failure? We tell ourselves, oh, I can never do that. I'm too old. I could never do that. You know, I don't have a college education. I could never do that. I don't speak English well enough. And we tell ourselves these lies. But the truth is the past does not determine the future, does it? What determines the future? Who determines the future? We do. When Abraham Lincoln was president, he was coming out of church one day, and the minister asked him, Mr. President, what would you think of my speech? What would you think of my sermon? <laughs> Abe says, well, it was, a, it was a wonderful sermon. It was a fine sermon. But you didn't challenge me to do anything great. Today, this morning, I'm not here to challenge you to be mediocre. I'm not challenging you to go home and you know, organize your closet. <laughs> I'm challenging you to do something great with the rest of your life. Some of you have a book inside of you that you need to write and share with the rest of us. Some of you have beautiful music 
that needs to be composed and put down and played by symphonies throughout the world. Some of you have leadership skills that can start an organization or lead an organization that will help people who are under-resourced, help teenagers that are underprivileged and who are abused. And we have to use those abilities. Now, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? You see, we tell ourselves, I'm not good enough. We tell ourselves, I can't do it. But that's not the truth. Today, I want you to leave here. And I want you to ignore the lies that say, I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have the right education. And I want you to go out and do something to change the world. Mr. President. Our fifth contestant, Hugh Dunbar. Proud to be an American. Proud to be an American, Hugh Dunbar. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished judges, guests. I've always been proud to be an American. Proud of my country, proud of its achievement, proud of it what, what it stands for. America is an exceptional country. During the bicentennial in 1976, my oldest daughter was then four years old. One morning I was taking her and her friends to the swimming pool, and there was an animated conversation in the back seat of my car about how great America is. And my daughter, now remember, she's four years old at the time, and it's the 200th anniversary of the founding of the country. My daughter said, every morning I wake up, I say, happy birthday, America. <laughs> she had every right and reason to be proud of her country. America is the only country in the history of the world that has been founded on an ideal. We believe that all men are created equal, that all people are, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them, Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Prior to America, countries were founded on blood, one's nationality. 
But since the beginning of our country, the door of citizenship has been flung wide open to anyone willing to come here, work hard, and forge a new life. The American ideal is the legacy of all Americans. Whether you are newly naturalized, or whether you are descendants of families that have been in this country for generations, everyone in this room has more in common with each other than we do with our ancestors, no matter where they came from. We are all more American than anything else. My mother was a naturalized American. She came from Canada to the United States as a young woman. During the 1950s, my brothers and I would go to Ontario, Canada to work on my uncle's farm. I have lots of Canadian cousins. <laughs> and kids being kids, we would get into heated arguments with each other about who had the greatest country, Canada or the United States. And one of these discussions was boiling over and my grandmother had to intervene to prevent an international incident. <laughs> so after everyone was calmed down and we all apologized for, to each other for the rude things we said to each other, my grandmother took me aside. My grandmother was a Canadian and she was fiercely proud of her country. But she said this to me. She said, you always stand up for your country. Always defend the United States of America. I have never forgotten that, and I have always done that. There are essentials that make America great. Individual liberty, as announced in the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. Freedom from government interference. Unfettered religious freedom, and the right to speak out for what you believe in, as well as the right to speak out against what you are opposed to. How deep felt is the dedication of Americans to individual liberty this deep. America is the only country in the history of the entire world where one race of people fought to free another race of people. The Civil War <clears throat> killed more than 600,000 men. It maimed scores of thousands more to extend individual liberty to each and every citizen. The rule of law, equitable, predictable rules, announced beforehand that everybody knows. Rules that are based on natural law that cannot be changed at the whim of those in charge. Rules that apply both to the governed and to the government. America has never had a privileged aristocracy. We have a meritocracy based on achievement. But the greatest essential of the American creed is God or a recognition of a power that transcends humankind, that there is at least some power greater than mankind. God is the only authority recognized in the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. The English writer G.K. Chesterton said, America has the soul of the church. It should come as no surprise to any of us that religion has deeply imbued the character of the American people. From the founding, many of the founders of the original 13 colonies were clergymen. Many Ivy League universities were founded as religious institutions. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all were founded as seminaries for the training of clergy. But freedom is not free. Our country and its ideals must be constantly defended. Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to our children. One of the founders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Roger Harper, said this. He likened America to a shining city on a hill beacon of liberty that will shine through the ages for all to see. Well, that beacon still shines today. Think, if you will, the Statue of Liberty. She stands in New York Harbor, majestically holding her torch of liberty high above the horizon.
for all the world to see. Next 4th of July is the 236th anniversary of the founding of our country. Oh, let's all wake up that morning. Let's all reflect on how privileged we are to live in this great country. <coughs> and along with my daughters, and now five granddaughters, <laughs> let's all say, Happy Birthday, America. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, give me all Contestant number six, Slavik Polinski, The Incredible Gift. The Incredible Gift, Slavik Polinski. Have you ever considered what an incredible gift hope is? Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and welcome guests. It doesn't matter who you were or what mistakes you've made in your past. If you have hope of a better tomorrow, you have power to transform your life today. Without hope, there can be no desire for change. A story of twin brothers. One was an alcoholic, the other a successful businessman. In an interview, they asked the first brother, how did you become an alcoholic? He replied, I had no choice. My father was an alcoholic. They asked the second brother, how did you become so successful? <clears throat> he replied, I had no choice. My father was an alcoholic. <laughs> These brothers grew up in the same environment. How did they turn out so different? The first brother believed he was a victim of his circumstances, that his fate had already been sealed. So he gave up hope. He gave up on his life. The second brother believed it didn't matter where you came from or who your mom and dad were. What matters is what you do. You are the one responsible for creating your own circumstances, your own destiny. <clears throat> this belief gave him hope. And that hope gave him the power to build a better life. Who gave? That second brother the incredible gift of hope. Could have been a friend, a teacher, minister, even a stranger. This story is dear to my heart. The men in my family have had a history of drinking problems. Growing up, alcohol was abundant in our home. My older brother and I were introduced to drinking at an early age. By 13, I was consuming alcohol every week. One day, my brother climbed behind the wheel of his car after drinking. Then he collided head on with another vehicle. My brother spent a year in jail. The driver of the other car lost a life. After his release, my brother continued drinking. And then he died at the young age of 54. His heart had become so weak no longer had the strength to keep on beating. 
For years, I cursed my brother. I cursed him for being weak. I cursed him for being selfish. I cursed him for destroying lives. When you're pointing the finger to blame at someone, there's three fingers pointing right back at you. This is the person who needs to be examined. I was so busy judging my brother for what he had done that I couldn't see that my own drinking was pushing my family and friends away. Most days you'd find me sitting in the bar with my friend Tom, neglecting my responsibilities as a husband and father. By the time I realized what was happening, I was devastated. I was depressed, hopeless. I thought, what's the point of fighting this? This is how it's meant to be. I have become just like my father and my brother. But I had a person in my life that wasn't buying into my mindset. She wasn't interested in my pity parties either. <laughs> my wife told me that I was a victim of my circumstances only if I chose to be. She helped me understand that I had the potential and power to transform my life into something incredible, something special. She believed. This belief gave me incredible hope. I didn't believe in myself yet, but I thought, maybe she's right. What if she is right? With her by my side, I found the strength to overcome incredible obstacles and challenges. I found the strength to face life head on and sober. I started by believing in her. But then over time, I began believing in myself. Without my wife's incredible gift of hope, I wouldn't be here today. Albert Einstein said, if this universe is a mistake, <laughs> well, we're all mistakes then. <laughs> but if there is meaning in this great universe, there is meaning in each and every one of us. He was later asked, so why are we here? His response, we are here for the sake of others only. For the sake of others. We're here to serve one another. The thing you say and do can change a life. A word of encouragement, that word of hope, it's an incredible gift to that person trying to take their first step in a journey thousand miles. I lost my brother six years ago, <coughs> and my friend Tom just recently passed away. His heart was also weakened through abuse. There are days I wonder what might have been if they had been given that same gift of hope that was given to me. As you leave here today, ask yourself, who can I encourage? Who needs me to believe in them? Who can I give that incredible gift of hope to? Do it today.
Contestant number seven, Lynn Pearson. What's in your dash? What's in your dash, Lynn Pearson? their legacy or their dash, they immediately associate it with children. What if you're one of the ones who have made the decision not to have children? What will be your legacy? What will be your dash? I'm one of those ones who made that decision early on not to have children. But the more I thought about my dash, I really began to wonder. What is the legacy that I'm going to leave, if not children? I got to thinking about my actions in the past, my interactions, people I've come in contact with. And then the light bulb dinged. I'm still here. Why am I dwelling in the past? I still have the opportunity to live and grow my dash. I have the opportunity to shape what I want people to think about me when they hear my name said. I started this by making very small changes. By nature, I am a major introvert. When I would walk past people, I would look everywhere but in the eye. Up, down, all of a sudden, some, all of a sudden something very important that I needed to study that was in my hand. <laughs> Anywhere but making eye contact. And then one day I decided to make eye contact. I made eye contact and I said, good morning. The pleasant smile and good morning I got back made me feel <laughs> wonderful inside. I wanted to give that to others. The next time I approached someone, not only did I say, good morning, but I inquired, how are you today? And waited patiently for the answer. When people think about me, I want them to be able to say she always had a warm smile on her face and a greeting for everyone she came in contact with. Volunteering is something that I have always been extremely passionate about. I didn't know it at the time, but through my volunteering activities, I was shaping my dash. When I volunteered for an organization, I was 100% participative. Did whatever was asked during the event, on time, stayed late, whatever it took. But when I left that event, I didn't think too much about the impact I had made on the lives that I touched. And then I joined Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Maryland. When you join that organization, it becomes a one-year commitment. All of a sudden, the way I volunteered changed. It was no longer a single event, but a relationship that I with my little and the Big Brothers Big Sisters organization. I was matched with my little 
for six years until she aged out of the program. <clears throat> Today, Alicia is a college graduate working on her master's degree, a mother, a homeowner, and most important to me, a volunteer working with teenage girls giving back. I want people to be able to say about me, she gave freely of her time and genuinely cared about others. All of us impact our environment around us. We have an opportunity to make sure we do that in a positive manner, simply by choosing the words we use. Do you use words such as wonderful, awesome, terrific, or do you use the negative words? I've chosen to try and use those positive words. In any situation that comes up, no matter how horrible or great, to make sure that I can learn something from it. I want people to say she always has had a positive attitude and learn something from every interaction. Whether we all know it or not, every single day we are creating our dash. Whether it's positive or negative is purely up to you. But will people say, he was the class clown, she was voted most likely to succeed, she has a terrific work ethic. That's in the past. The great thing about it is we're all here. We all have the opportunity to say, that's the past. Moving forward, I'm going to shape my dash. When you shape your dash, you have that opportunity to leave the legacy and how people will think of you and create whatever you want. What will your legacy be? What will your impact in your environment be? When people hear your name said, what will they think of you? What's in your dash? Judges, when you're done with your ballots, if you please hold those above your heads so you know to collect those from everyone in a timely fashion.
ballot from judges, so please remain quiet for just another minute. <coughs> And now the part of the contest that all the other people are looking forward to and the contestants should be dreading. <laughs> if you've seen me asking questions before, it's a lovely, but we'll try and make it fun and happy and light today, about a minute for each person. We're also going to get a certificate for the contestants, and most of the people today will get a certificate for participation. And then some of the contestants, obviously, will be winning today and getting nice hardware to take home. Our first contestant, we're going to talk to the table con table topic contestants first. Our first contestant, as you might have remembered, is Sarah Schiffer. Sarah, you want to come up for a minute? Sarah has the distinction of being one of several people who beat me in a contest last year, so congratulations, Sarah. I'm not talking to you today. <laughs> How long have you been in Toastmasters? It should be a long time to beat somebody as experienced as me, but it'll probably be like six months. Like three days. Yeah, three days. I should be that contest and beat your what? Thank you very much. How long have you been Toastmasters? We're not going to go through the standard questions so much. We like to go off the biographical information. And uh, a notable accomplishment for Sarah is she's eaten something with sugar, sugar in it every day in her life. Isn't that an accomplishment? <laughs> Tell us about that fantastic accomplishment. Well, you know, I mean, it's been a lot of hard work. I <laughs> early. Basically, I have a big sweet tooth. It doesn't have to be cane sugar. It could be organic sugar. It could even be mango sugar. But I find it very difficult to go through a whole day without something sweet because we all just need more sweetness. <laughs> Second contestant was John Harris. John? Yeah. And John is a member of the Platinum Toastmasters. How long have you been a Platinum Toastmaster? Platinum Toastmaster, eight years. Okay, somewhere else before that? Sounded like there was some other butt or the other one. Was. You going to tell us about it? Yeah, I've been a Toastmaster for 17 years. Oh, All right. Wow. I was Toastmaster through the 80s. Was not in the 90s and came back eight years ago and have been in platinum ever since. Awesome. Well, <laughs> had a rough time partying in the 80s. <laughs> 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 it was going to be grad school or Toastmasters. <laughs> I did, in the early, about 10 years ago, in the early 2000s, I did eulogies for each of my parents as they passed away. And I struggled with that, and I realized, John, you need to get back to Toastmasters. There you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Another fantastic accomplishment. Uh, John walked here from, uh, from home. Congratulations. Could have done much more.
says, pregnant with my daughter, didn't walk okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> Just jumped right in there. <laughs> Jill, uh, Jill had a special thing, and now I know why. Uh, the way I pronounced her name, she wanted to make sure it was Morgan Thaler, like a dollar. So that was easy for me to remember, so I appreciate that. Interest in um, scuba diving and voice lessons, and I'm assuming that those aren't done concurrently. <laughs> no. That would be known as drowning. For us ladies. <laughs> Yes, I Why don't love, you tell us about that? I love scuba diving. In fact, I brought my scuba diving buddy uh, Andy along because I wanted him to see what Toastmasters is about. First time I scuba dived was back in California in the 80s in a kelp bed, and the seal came up and started playing hide and seek with me. Aww. And it's like, this is my sport. Aww. That's wonderful. And you're uh, currently working with Homeland Security as a consultant. Yes, I am. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I used to run Homeland Security for the great state of Illinois. I am now a consultant. I work with Washington and firms. We go on Navy bases. We put on terrorist strikes, and I, I get to grade them. And um, we're in a good state, but we always have to stay vigilant. Um, we're not good enough yet, especially Chicago. Mm. Well, speaking of vigilant, the person that left their phone on and <laughs> had it beeping, uh, we had her take care of it. So <laughs> 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 She's going to make mincemeat out of you before long. I'll leave this to the professionals. <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier on that side of the <laughs> You are a lab technician, however, from FONA International, or F-O-N-A. What could you tell us a little bit about that? FONA International is a manufacturing and producing company. We manufacture and produce flavors for the food and beverage industry, as well as some pharmaceuticals. So. You go to the grocery store and you're trying to decide between maple brown sugar oatmeal and apple cinnamon oatmeal. It's because we put flavors in it. You probably should talk to the one that likes the chicken sandwich. Thanks for participating. as it goes along because they know that they're going to be in for it when they get up here. So that's not that good. <laughs> Contestant number five, but I'm frightened about this one, is, is Tori. Tori Libby. <laughs> I, I, I try and listen to everything while I'm over there preparing for in between the little speaking. And I, I heard something about, guys hear about this, I don't know what happened, and then I perked up right away. You talk about sex, is that what the... <laughs> 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 I <laughs> Everyone's ear perks up when they hear that. So what, what exactly do you do for the last nine years in talking about teens about sex? I work with an organization called Amplify Youth Development, and we are mostly in DuPage County. We figured out that we hit teens at some point in their um, junior high or senior high year, about 40% of the teens in DuPage County. We stretch out a little bit farther west of Kane a little, and we're as far east as LaGrange, even a few places. So we speak in mostly schools, public schools, but also some private schools and some um, community centers and churches and things like that. So, so love what so I do. Tori, tell me a little bit about what kind of background you have. who I did get them safely through those teen years, and now they're in their 20s. So I guess that would qualify me. Husband currently involved in this? Yes, uh, he's still in the picture. Oh, never mind. That's fine. <laughs> No. 
Nelson. Mr. Yeah. Nelson. Yeah. And Roger wrote down that one of his interests, uh, in, in addition to being a Hinsdale Toastmaster, is cycling. For those of you who were not a Toastmaster last year, I had the pleasure of participating or coming out to the contest uh, for the humorous speech contest last year. Did anybody see the person who talked talk about cycling? Is yeah. that still online? It's not. Okay. It's if it's if it's from the fall of last year. Yes. It's on my YouTube account, and it's still accessible. If you get a chance and you have not seen the person Just discussing cycling, Sarah, fine. Uh, go online and try and not only enjoy your own presentations today, but go look at the person who talked about cycling. It is an unbelievable, unbelievably funny presentation. So, uh, so Roger, how can you top that? <laughs> I had to, had to change a tire when I was about oh, eight, 15 miles away from my car. Mm -hmm. so, not necessarily funny, but... <laughs> well, you're right there. <laughs> <laughs> it also says you play racquetball. Yes. Do you have any interesting <laughs> anecdotes about that? Racquetball, yeah, racquetball is pretty interesting. I was playing another player one time, and if you're not familiar with a racquetball court, it usually has a window above the back wall. And occasionally the ball will sail out the window, and then you have to you go retrieve it or ask the person in the court uh, across the hall from you to throw it back. <laughs> but in any case, I was playing an individual one time, and I hit a shot. This person hit a shot that instead of going forward towards the front wall like it's supposed to, went almost straight up. <laughs> and you couldn't do this if you were trying. <laughs> It went out the window. <laughs> the wall was right here. She's right here. The wall, wall went out the window, nailed the ceiling tile. The ceiling tile came crashing down. <laughs> half of it stayed upstairs. Half the ceiling tile came crashing into the court. <laughs> and this, this poor young lady I was playing with was going, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just laughing my butt off. I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> that, that was kind of thing. Was a little more than that song. is National ne Novel Writing Month, and it comes every year in, no in November. And the idea is that you get to write a novel in 30 days. You have to write 50,000 words in 30 days. Wow. And I did it. <laughs> but you can imagine, it ain't good. <laughs> I didn't even get some time to edit it. And I paid someone to do that. Actually, I asked my son first, who is a writer. I said, Daryl, what do you think? He said, I'd love to do that for you, Mom. Uh, about, I don't know, maybe two or three weeks later, I said, what do you think? What do you think, Daryl? And he said, uh, so at some point, Mom, you got to have a story. <laughs> Facility for us to put it together. You put it under cover. I had my picture of my trip to Europe on the front. I have a really great real estate picture. That <laughs> still even looks like me. And you know what? A little description. It's kind of pretty. It's a terrible novel. But on my, I remember the day it came, my daughter, my granddaughter, Maya was there, and I opened up the box, and I, I really was kind of surprised. And she looked at it and she said, Grandma, did you write that book? And I said, yes, I did, Maya. 
and I didn't get to look through these questions quite as thoroughly as I did for the table topics, are for the international speakers. But before I have that, it's difficult for me sometimes to remain just the Toastmaster. And i got to say, today that was one of those cases. There were some really moving speeches today, very poignant and uh, inspirational as well as emotional. So I wanted to thank all the participants today on the table topic side, but especially on the international side today. How about our round First contestant today in the international side was Karen Johnson. Karen, you want to come on up? And Karen, you are with Beyond the Seas Toastmasters in Lockport. You're also a legal assistant. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Beyond the Seas is in Aurora. I live in Lockport. Oh, Lockport, sorry. Uh, and what was I going to tell you about? about the legal, legal assistant. assistant. I work for an advertising agency in Chicago in the legal department. And actually, after my boss of 20 years passed away, I started working with a different attorney, and now I'm doing ad review and intellectual property. So it's, it's become rather interesting. Yeah. Doritos Locos Tacos at Taco Bell. That's one of our recent things. So <laughs> we'll try one again. <laughs> <laughs> Participant with Ramon, Ramon Joseph. Your uh, your interests include running, swimming, and biking, and it also says you're a self-employed business owner. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your your business? Well, my business is a carpet cleaning business. Been in business for uh, 21 years. And, uh, so far, so good. But I want to talk about running, though. Because about running. Right, right now, I should be running. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I trained for several months. For this, right now, ultra marathon in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And when I moved to the division contest, I said, I have a dilemma here. Do you want to go to the marathon or over here? And I said, one of my buddies said, you better go to the Tosmas. 30 people will be beating you <laughs> when you come back for a meeting, so I'm here. I, I love it here. At least I'm not tired and not <laughs> And yet, this is the only person who used the chair. <laughs> so distinct that they didn't print a certificate for them all. So we're going to have to print up a different certificate for them all. Our third competitor was Nancy, Nancy Depchik. Let's see, let's see, let's see what we have here. Notable accomplishments, being here in the contest. That's true. Peggy Notebart, Nature Museum, is your employer. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Nature Museum? I'm not familiar with that. It's a tiny, tiny little museum in Lincoln Park. Peggy Notebart, Nature Museum, we're known for our butterflies. It has an atrium with about a thousand butterflies flitting around. I sell educational programs to the school. So I go around to the different schools, I show them the different workshops we have for teachers and students, and try to get someone to buy it. Mm -hmm. I wish I could be as funny as you, Bruce, but I can't. <laughs> That's all I got. Okay. <laughs> you can't. That's all I got. <laughs> Years of practice and clowning around, you don't want to pick this up all at the same time. <laughs> Our fourth contestant was Paul Sturgis. Is Paul Sturgis? Paul, you want to come Not, uh, not surprisingly, Paul's in in sales. Good presence. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about your employer, Sound Planning? Yeah, actually, uh, I started the company in 1976, and then I sold it about three years ago. 
Contestant is Hugh Dunbar. Hugh Dunbar. <laughs> I had to run out and use the restroom in between there, and I knew going with Hugh speaking would be fine because then I don't know if you noticed at the end he yelled out really loud, Mr. Toastmaster, where is he? <laughs> he knew how to cover for me. I uh, Hugh, let's see. Baseball. Love baseball. Baseball, one of the interests. Um, do you have Sox. a team that's won in the last 104 years? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, the, White Sox. Oh, the White Sox have done that. So and congratulations. Done that. Well, don't congratulate me, but I took great pleasure in it. Uh, one other thing I'd like to say, I've been in Toastmasters a few years. I'm, I'm hesitant to say how long. <laughs> it's my service to the community. And I, I really, really want to say this. I do this, I stay with Toastmasters to a great extent for, because it's uh, my avocation, but the area governors, the division governors, uh, Cynthia, Don, our immediate past district governor, believe me, this is the end of the contest season now. This can be staggering for them. So let's help them out and get all the clubs, everything they need, because uh, they dedicate a lot of time and money. <laughs> so, and I'm not getting paid for this, but I've done it. And, and they, they do it because they love the organization, as I do. So congratulations. Thank you for all your efforts and your dedication. And let's help them out. Swavik, Swavik Polinski. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> oh, Swavik's got some outstanding points here. Uh, he works for United Parcel Service since 1980, making deliveries. His wife, Lori, that's what I was looking for. Your yeah. wife, Lori, on the sheet here. You can tell that that means a lot to you. Yes, it does. So why don't you just tell us a little bit more? Well, my wife, Lori, uh, she's my inspiration. Yeah. Somehow they managed to get it. <laughs> and though all, although I feel like I could do this all afternoon and still you'd all be having fun and enjoying yourselves, we only have one to go. So there's Lynn Pierce and Lynn. and doing things with uh, the community here. It seems to be having some interest in kickboxing. Yes. You want to tell us a little bit about that? I know there's some facilities opening up in the area that are 
more kickboxing in nature. Is that the place that you go? No, I actually go to martial arts school not far from my house at Stratford Square. <coughs> they have a huge school there. I've been doing kickboxing, with the exception of broken bones, torn ligaments. I've been doing it for about eight years now. Wow, that's outstanding. And what degree of, of success is the schools, oh, the schools I go to now, they don't do that. The one in Maryland, I was a brown belt in kickboxing. Okay. <coughs> Illinois, again, leading the pack. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that here. You just participate in your little <laughs> Republicans up there.
reward for these next couple of uh, accomplishments. Has anybody gotten a CC in the last 30 days? Very good. Sixty-six people in attendance today. Sixty-six people in attendance. 